Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. Hello and welcome automotive world. This is the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name is Sean Tipping. I will be your host today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, I have a special guest with me on the show, Hans Jorgensen. Hans is a automotive diagnostic technician at Utah Imports in Salt Lake City, Utah. He is also an uh, adjunct automotive instructor for a local community college as well. Um, I'm really excited to talk to Hans today, so let's get right into the interview. Well, Hans, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I gotta say, you know, through Facebook, I've always been uh, pretty impressed with uh, some of the creative stuff that you've uh, shown and shared in some of the Facebook groups. Um, just really apparent, you know, that you're putting in a lot of effort uh, to grow your skills and just to, to learn new things uh, within the, the automotive realm. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, thanks. Um, last year, so I haven't done as much creative stuff. Uh, last year, I got put back on flat rate. And so now it's all about hanging brakes and water pumps and all that fun stuff. So my, my creativity is kind of stumped a little bit, but um, I, still, I still get a chance to pull the scope out and check things with it. It's tough on the, when you're on that flat rate side because, yeah, your, your paycheck at the end of the week or two weeks or whatever is so dependent on can you crank out those hours. And it's yeah. do I pull in another 1.5 hour job or do I get some known goods? And, uh, yeah, usually your wallet yeah. is the talking there. I know, I know exactly how you feel when I was at Firestone. That was – that was my life. I, I don't have time to do that stuff unless I wanted to do it at home. Yeah. And, and again, when I do get new cars in, I try to get as many new known goods as I can. Just, just random stuff, whatever I have time and what's easily accessible. So got to have them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, they can uh, be a huge help it's that that time when you need them you're like dang i wish i would have uh done yeah <laughs> taking the yeah. time on that car when i had it in my bay awesome so you are for the listeners anybody listening you are located in salt lake city utah um correct. and you are working right now at utah imports is that correct yep we're um independent volkswagen audi uh our side of the shop is is volkswagen audi and subaru and then the other side does BMW, Volvo, and Mini. Okay, so pretty much all European yeah. stuff there. Yeah. So you're, you're doing mostly Volkswagen stuff yourself then? Yeah, Volkswagen, Audi primarily. Okay. And we work on almost everything Volkswagen. Um, my, uh, water-cooled cars pretty much from 90, 93 on up and um regular cars and we also do a lot of vanigan work so lots and lots of vanigan campers come through our doors now is, is that like uh early 90s 80s stuff that they're bringing 80. in oh yeah okay yeah, i see a lot of 80s cars is that the uh the t3 model yep yep okay T3. We work on t3s and t4s i've only worked on a a handful of those throughout my career and I, I remember the first time I'm trying to figure out where is the engine <laughs> located yeah, on this thing yeah. <laughs> for, for anybody who hasn't worked on one it's in the, it's in the back it's a rear engine vehicle yeah. and there's a, a panel that you got to pop open and what do they have it's a is it a flat four engine in yep. those horizontally opposed 2.1 liter for most of them yeah the earlier ones had 1.9 liters okay I had remembered, or you, you had told me that you were into the, the Vanagans, and I was just doing a little bit of Googling on them. 
Um, and I saw that this is kind of maybe just a random fact, but the, maybe maybe you knew this that Porsche built some uh, VW Vanagons in the 80s. There's only like 10 or 15 of them made. Uh, they call it the B. B B32. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so those had a, a 230 horsepower, <laughs> um, three, two liter Porsche engine that would do 135 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Oh, no, uh, actually, um, it's a really popular platform for engine swaps. Um, in the United States, most people do Subaru engines in them because they're, they're horizontally opposed. Um, my personal van, I did the TDI swap, so 1.9 turbo diesel. Um, in Europe, you'll find all sorts of things like V8 swaps, um, mid-engine V8, mid-engine V6, it, almost everything, almost everything you can think of. So they've got uh, quite the following. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So you've got you've got one. What year is that? Um, I have six. <laughs> okay, <laughs> six. Yeah, six. Um, the main one I drive is a 1986 Synchro Westfalia with the TDI in it, and then I have a handful of others. Okay, other random ones. Yeah, I've seen people um, uh, like convert them into campers and stuff like that. Yeah, well, Volkswagen sent them to Westfalia to have campers installed, camper interiors. And so um, my particular van started in Wolfsburg, Germany, and then it went to Graz, Austria to get the four-wheel drive stuff put in, and then it went to Westfalia to have the camper interior built. So it actually has three build dates. Oh, wow. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Well, you'll have to send me some uh, some pictures of that. I I got another friend that's into the VWs. He was actually looking at getting one of those. So that's pretty yeah. cool. Well, um, they're expensive now, unfortunately. I, I saw some of the prices for the you know the ones that are in really nice shape. I mean, I'm talking thirty grand. I I saw, and that was just yeah. a quick search. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a couple people have a couple come through the shop. People have paid a um, hundred thousand dollars for a two-wheel drive camper, and I wasn't that impressed. Wow. Yeah, people with, with lots of money <laughs> like to spend money on weird things. <laughs> That's nuts. Well, well, do you got uh, you got plans for some of your six vanigans to make a little extra cash then? <laughs> Um, actually, no. Um, I, I like them too much, unfortunately. Uh, I have a, I bought a 92 wheel drive camper that is um, being built up and we're actually going to send it to Europe to live there. So the van's going to stay there and um, my wife's in Germany. So we're going to fly over, pick up the van, and then we'll have our hotel and rental car built in. Okay. Um, It'll only take take about six trips to make that worthwhile. Four or five years worth of of trips going back and forth, and it's completely worth it. You always been into Volkswagens and the the European. <clears throat> yeah, the only thing I've owned outside of a Volkswagen is an Audi. Okay, <laughs> so I'm close enough, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I also. Uh... Also, here you're uh, you're a hockey player. I have sometimes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I try my best to stay uh, stay vertical out there. Yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Are you? Uh, they open leagues and rinks back up where you're at yet? Nope, we've been closed since um, middle of March or beginning of March, I think, and. Um, I really don't know when it's going to open back up. So that's, that's kind of annoying because that's, that's kind of my exercise besides work. I don't do anything else besides work and yard work. So it's nice to get out on the ice once in a while. Yeah, no kidding. That's, uh, 
that's a great, great form of exercise and yeah. uh, just uh, good to see some people, but that, that's the problem. You know, it's yeah. heavy breathing and uh, pushing each other out there. It's, it's not a great, the locker room's not a great scenario for yeah. everything that's going on. Um, they had, they just opened up the rinks around here uh, in the last couple of weeks and they are easing into some games, but there's a ton of restrictions. Yeah. You got to get changed in the parking lot and, uh, cool. you know, you got to move in and out of there pretty quickly. And so, yeah, um, hopefully eventually it goes back to normal. But <laughs> Yeah, wow. I think, I think that would be worth it right, right about now. That's hard. Yeah, it's it's so – I mean, everything right now is just so tough to uh, say what's the right thing to do or not. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know, uh, Paul Danner, he plays too. So uh, maybe maybe someday we can all get together and get on the ice somehow or another. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought about that. It'd, it'd be fun. Um, there's actually a, um air traffic controller tournament. And the team that I play on here is primarily comprised of air traffic controllers. Um and I've actually been to that tournament. They, they play it all over the world. Um, so I've played in Minneapolis, um, Vancouver, and Calgary. Wow. So they have, yeah, they, they, they have it someplace different in the world each year. It's been in Slovakia. It's been in Finland. It's been in, um, well, far eastern Canada. Um, can't remember the name right now labrador islands or something dang that's that's really cool <laughs> it is really cool and there's like 20 teams that show up from all over the world i mean we've, we've played against russians and slovakians and canadians and um it's it's really fun and the russians stack their team pretty good <laughs> so no way <laughs> yeah yeah we have a we have a tournament around here in the spring every year, uh, close to where I live, and it's it draws quite the crowd, um, people from all over the country. But we get some uh, some guys down from Canada too, since we're right there on the border. And yeah, there's always some team stacking going on. I mean, they're they're playing yeah. as soon as they can uh, as soon as they can crawl up there, but in Canada. But <laughs> those are those are always the guys that usually walk away with the trophy. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's. I I started ice skating when I was in middle school, and so those people have a lot lot of time on me. Yeah, I I didn't pick it up till I was in my twenties, actually, and um, I, I was living with my roommates, and we had a rink down the road, and we're like, well, let's strap on some skates and see mm -hmm. see how this goes, and yeah, it just was, was a lot of fun, and like you said, great exercise, and. Uh, so I just, uh, I've kept up with it. Um, but yeah, when you, you, you see, you pick that stuff up as a kid so much easier than when you're an adult. It's, it's a lot tougher of a learning curve at that point. I agree. Yeah. Um, you are working towards, or uh, you can fill me in. Maybe you've already made some of these steps towards being an automotive instructor. Um, at a at a community college can you uh, tell me a little bit about that yeah so i finished my two-year degree um automotive service technician um about 18 years ago i think and when i was in school i was thinking wow these instructors have it pretty good you know they don't really work on cars they, they have about six or seven hour work day and um, three or four months off. And so immediately after I got out of school, I went to the local university or actually um, it's about, it's a, it's a couple hours North, but they have a, at the time it was called um, trade and industry education to your uh, four year degree. And um, so I started that and I, I knocked out a lot of hours. And that summer when I came home, I started working at a French shop and I never went back to school. Um, 
about three years ago, I was contacted by one of my old instructors. He stopped by to pick up some Volkswagen parts and he said, you, you should apply. And so I did. And now I'm adjunct instructor. And so adjunct substitute. So I fill in any of the classes when instructors are gone. Um, and so that's given me a foot in the door. Besides that, I've also started going to their advisory board meetings um, as an employee of an independent shop. And so I get to see who, who's there, um, what their plans are for the school, how they can um, increase student retention or, or work towards um, better skills, what the employers need, kind of things like that. And so that's, that's also given me insight to what goes on at the school. Yeah. And so for anybody who's not familiar, um, this is a, a ASE accredited program, I, I assume. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so for part of that accreditation, and it's true for a lot of different college programs, but part of the ASE accreditation is that you have to have uh, an advisory committee and that it consists of uh, local shop owners, uh, technicians, former students. Uh, you can even have current students on there and it can be administration within the college and they come in and it's just for, for us, it's really to try to get feedback um, a lot of the times, like, you know, what are you looking for uh, in these students when you hire them? Or what are you seeing with our students that like or that could be improved? Um, what do you think of our facilities? What do you think of what we're teaching? And we get feedback from the real world, which is crucial, I think. Um, and yeah, so that was actually how I ended up getting um, involved into teaching was I was on the advisory committee. Uh, for the program I'm in. And that's how I found out, okay, this guy's retiring. They're looking for somebody. Um, and I was able to, able to get in, but yeah, if anybody is out there, you want to support your, you know, local um, tech program, uh, go get on the advisory committee. Most of them are looking for people. Um, and they hold meetings a couple times a year. Um, it, it's, it's totally worth it. Uh, I think to get that feedback from the real world. Yeah, and a note, um, most of the people in our advisory are dealers. And so they are looking for, honestly, the cheap labor that's coming out with a little bit of training. But um, they mentioned that, yeah, they need to start looking towards more towards the independent aftermarket shops because that's where a lot of people need to go. And that's, I think, I personally believe where pay is going to be higher and you might get more um, more out of it, really. Not to say the dealer world's bad, but um, there's a lot of really good aftermarket training available for independent shops if you get in a good one. Yeah, it's everybody's got their right fit, what's right for them. Um, but man, the, the independent aftermarket world for automotive, I mean, if you're, if you're looking for a challenge, you're looking to learn as much as you can um, and, and not have the same thing day after day after day, that's, that's the place to go. There's challenges. It's tough, but um, you, get, you get a little bit of everything. And um, I mean, even, even for a specialty shop like yours that focuses on certain lines, um, that's going to be different than a, a dealer aspect, I believe. Yeah, I, I mean, I work on cars pre-OBD, OBD1 and OBD2. You know, I, I work on one or two makes primarily, and I see 30 years worth of technology in cars. So it, it gets interesting. Yeah, that's nuts. And it's kind of tough to think of another industry you know, where you're fixing stuff that you see that, I mean, if you, uh, let's say you repair f cell phones or laptops, computers, stuff like that, I mean, w maybe, maybe five, eight years old on some of this stuff. And we're seeing things that are, yeah, 20, 30 years old, all the different styles of technology. Uh, it's, it's, 
<laughs> at, at times overwhelming, <laughs> but uh, I guess the longer you're in it, at least uh, you can uh, jog the memory banks and pull up some old information <laughs> you got back there. Yeah, it's well, it's it's like Jim Morton says, cars are cars, and 80% of cars are exactly the same. It's the 20% that makes them that vehicle. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> the ultimate goal is uh, still the same, and uh, nut, nuts and bolts, electricity works the same. That's always yeah. been my favorite part about electrical side of things, is it doesn't care if it's a a BMW or a Honda or a 1970 or 2020. <laughs> Those, uh, a spark. a sparks a spark. That's right. That's right. So you're, you're eventually looking to transition uh, from the adjunct to a full-time instructor at some point. Yes. Someday. Um, at about the same time I had applied for the, um, substitute position, I contacted my university and um, there's about a 15 year limit on credits. So oh, they, man. yep, they, um, they pulled a couple strings and I was right at the limit and they let me back in with all my credits and I only had to complete about another, um, I think 18 credits worth to get my bachelor's degree. Okay. And so I, I finished that, got my bachelor's degree, and um, now I just wait for somebody to retire. Gotcha. Yeah, that can be the, the, the tough part is some of these instructors will stay in the positions for 20, 30 years. And actually there's still two instructors there. One of them was my um, engine electrical, engine and electrical instructor and um yeah i think he's been there 25 years yeah and same with me the guy i'm working with was my instructor and in, i think he's 22 23 years in at the moment so it's it's definitely a cool thing to go back uh to the same school that you actually learned at that's uh, for me it was a really cool experience that first year i'm just like wow i'm i'm here helping out uh these students to get ready for their career, uh, just like I was, uh, you know, it, it was really, really awesome. I, I feel very lucky to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I really like that aspect of it. Um, another thing about, you know, going in and being young and in the modern, well, in the current industry is, um, you know, a lot of things are changing. There's you know, while, while I learned scope use back then, it wasn't prevalent and certainly not all the shops had scopes. Um, and all we did was, you know, check spark and AC ripple on alternators and a few little things like that. There wasn't a ton of computer control parts back in 1998. You know, there, there's a lot, but not like there is now. And so times are changing and I think that students need to need to learn new stuff and and the basics are changing in my opinion you know, what used to be basic 20 years ago is is still basic but now you, you have to know so much more so I, I think that's that's fun part of the business but um, I think we're going to have to market it to students a little bit differently than before. Yeah, the recruitment part of it uh, is definitely changing. And we go out to, you know, a lot of high schools to do recruitment events. And well, back when, back when we could, um, we haven't done any this spring or summer, but um, it's, it's definitely, we, and we have talks about it, like how, how do we want to present? How do we want to sell this to pre perspective students to young people that aren't sure what they want to do um, what part of the automotive world is going to be you know the most attractive to them and it's tough to say because you still got uh, you know just your traditional uh, gearheads out there that want to wrench on stuff uh, and tear stuff apart but with so much being computer um, controlled I think there's just a whole nother 
type of person that can be attracted to this industry, but it's got to be presented correctly for that to happen. I agree. I mean, you know, most, most of, a lot of my day is spent on the computer, you know, or, or a scanner, whether, you know, and, a, and a lot of the scanners are Android based. So it's, it's like, it's just a big cell phone, really. And so we need to get the people who are into computer programming and just electronics in general and show them that, yeah, by in a couple of years, half the cost of the vehicle is only going to be electronics. And, and there's almost miles of wire inside one vehicle. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's been very, uh, very interesting for me to see uh, with the students that I've had so far, the, the type of person or the type of mindset that's been successful um, through, the, through the program. And, you know, obviously there's different areas and there's a guy that can just, you know, shine in that um, throwing a transmission in or doing brakes, a suspension, the mechanical nuts and bolts side of things. And then they struggle on the electrical or the computer side, but you've got the opposite as well. You got guys that are just on that stuff and they, they just have a natural ability for it um, to be yeah. successful on that side. And, and man, the industry needs those people really yeah, bad. We, we, need, we need both of them. Yeah. Yeah. They're both very valuable. So, I mean, on that note, um, and again, if somebody listening is not familiar, um, these programs are ASE Education Foundation accredited. It was formerly NATEF. And what that means is that there's a set of guidelines, a set of standards that the programs have to meet, and they go through an accreditation process and an on-site evaluation of the program. They have uh, people come in, they go through the whole program, fine tooth comb. We just did it this spring. It's a huge process. They go through all your paperwork, your instruction, the facilities, the tools, um, all this stuff to make sure that you're meeting these standards. Um, and then once you're done, you are accredited. Um, and, and then that just shows that you are up to the standards um, of what ASE sets, and which I think is a really good thing. I, I think that's awesome that that's there. Otherwise, it's just sort of the wild west, whatever somebody wanted to teach, you know, based on that college, they could. But he, but there are some things that you have to follow in the instruction in some of these areas, you have to have the students perform this task, or um, they have to go through this certain process, you have to teach this. So I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about that. And what your thoughts on some of these ASE standards were, um, if you, if you have any. Um, like I said, um, the basics are changing. And what I notice in the field is we're starting to see less, um, repair of transmissions. And so, you know, transmissions is still automatic and manual transmissions is still a class. They still have to meet all the NATEF standard, ASE Education Foundation standards for it. But dealerships and um, independent shops alike typically aren't digging into transmissions. They, they are, they, and there there are still specialty repair shops that do it. Um, we, our shop used to rebuild them as well, but we just, we just stopped. It's, it's cheaper and more reliable just to either throw a used transmission in there or to get a factory reman. So that's one issue I see with it. Um, the other I have, it's not a personal issue with, but I just don't use it anymore is, um, really rebuilding engines. I mean, yeah, there, I know lots of shops still rebuild them, but when, when the studies are done that tell us 70% of all the work that's being done in shops is regular maintenance, fluid changes, belts, you know, filters, stuff like that, that's 70% of the work that's being done. 
while I agree that it's good information to know how an engine works inside, I don't think that that trumps knowing how electricity works. And so if I had my way to design a two-year class, I would like to see pretty much a one semester introduction to automotive, which teaches you honestly everything from tools to knowing how to change oil belts and um, light maintenance like that. And from that, it would just go two years to um, electrical, electrical and diagnosis, and then, or two semesters, I'm sorry. And then after that, one semester of shop work, either working on anything that comes into the school shop or um, the instructors visiting the student's workplace and making sure that the shop foreman or, um, you know, if, if the student's an apprentice, talk to um, whoever he's apprenticing under, make sure that he's learned all the correct things, make sure that he's on time and doing everything correctly. You know, what can the program do different next time? Um, you know, just try to get the student to um, be up to speed the best we can and, and valuable for the employee. You know, that's, that's what I want out of the student. I want the student to make money and to make their employer money. So it's, it's a hard it's a hard thing. And, and right now, when I have substituted at the school, um, I've taken in my old books from when I was a student, and I can match them up with the current books that, that they had last year. And um, it's almost paragraph for paragraph the same thing. And these are, these are current books. So they're, they're switching up to a online learning system next year, which I haven't gotten to look at yet, but I hope, I hope that it's gonna work really well and it's definitely gonna save the students money. So that's gonna be a big plus. Yeah, that, uh, that uh, I'm, we're not even sure yet at this point whether we're gonna have classroom stuff this fall or not. So we've gotta to go to more online stuff and that's a, that's a whole nother discussion on how online learning really doesn't work for the trades. Um, but uh, to, to your point, yeah, how you construct these classes, um, I, I really like what, you know, you're presenting there and a really strong uh, focus on electrical. And we really try to do that with ours. You know, we have the electrical course that we've always had, but for my courses, I really try to build it into everything because it's built into everything on the car. You know, every system, yeah. no matter if it's brakes or, or transmission or whatever, you've got electrical. So I put it into what we're doing. Okay. We're going to be talking about, um, uh, we're, we're going to be talking about this system. Well, does it have a solenoid? Let's go through this circuit. Let's look at see how, how can we, um, you know, measure this circuit? How can we figure out what's wrong with it? Even though maybe we're, in more of a mechanical course, but at the same time, you got to meet those, those task guidelines. And yeah, it's, it's tough at points. The, the one I think that we spend a lot of time on, it's a big course is the engine repair course. Like you mentioned, um, as a tech, I never actually like did a full rebuild on an engine. I didn't work in that type of shop. I know some guys do. And if you go to work at a machine shop, it's great information, but I think your average technician, I don't know that they're building engines. Um, the basics on how it works, yes, really important, but you know, uh, measuring valve seat runout and valve spring height, and that, that gets time consuming when they're adding things onto the car every single year that we don't know where to put <laughs> that in our coursework. Yeah. And, and my, my argument would be if you're getting into a shop that does that kind of work, they will actually train you to do that work. So it's, and, and there will almost always be an older guy there who knows how to rebuild engines. 
you know, I, I've, I've rebuilt my own and, and cut valves and done all that stuff. Um, we just don't do it as a shop. Yeah. It's like, if you're going to go, you know, from a tech program like ours, it's, which we don't cater to a specific brand and you want to go be a BMW tech, well, you'll learn all the specifics about BMWs when you get into that role. We want to, we want to set you up with the basics and yeah, some of that stuff, I think, like you were mentioning the, the basics, what, what basics are we really going to be focusing on? And yeah, electrical should almost be the center of most of it, I, I think. And maybe that's, uh, maybe I'm partial to that because I also see the side of it from the field where there's so many techs that just have almost nothing as far as electrical skills. They can yeah. hang, hang parts all day, but if they got to pull out their meter, or their test light, uh, not, they don't they really know where to go. Um, and yeah, it's, it's hard to forget how to hang brakes, but it's really easy forget to forget how a solenoid works, you know? So, um, I, if, if I were to get my way, I would actually have an industrial electronics class be a prerequisite for automotive. You know, you have to take this electronics class to get into automotive. And that way, we've taken care of Ohm's law, um, Kirchhoff's law, all, hopefully all that stuff. And then we can move into specific automotive. You know, I, I don't have a lot of, um, I don't have a ton of good service information. We have all data and identifix. And primarily what I use them for is wiring diagrams. If I get an electrical circuit, um, even a lot of fault codes, if you know how all that stuff works electrically, it's a lot easier to figure it out, especially with a scope. Yeah, and a scope usage, uh, you know, that's, that's even a step beyond, um, uh, you know, some guys that have basic electrical, uh, most of these, most of the shops that I go to, They've never, never used or seen a scope before. So I, yeah. I try to they get my, know, they, they don't even know that it's in their scan tool. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. The snap ons. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, that's one thing I, I made a change and they do give us some freedom at the college to run the course the way we want, which is awesome. I really, really like that. And so the one change I made is like, let's get some scopes in here. So we got a Pico, yeah. we got some U scopes and um, I just let them go to town on it. I mean, we have some structure and everything, but I want them to get used to using these and you know, that that's not a, it's not a scary thing at all. It's helpful. It's, you're going to understand this better uh, if you take some time with it. Yeah. It's, it's all it is is a visual voltage over time. It's yeah. really that simple. It's drawing a picture for you. That's, that's what I always tell them. Like it's, this is a picture. Yeah. You get a number on your voltmeter, but look, you, you get a picture here. It's even better. Yeah. <laughs> it made it a lot easier for me to start using a scope for electrical dyad stuff. Yeah. Uh, my, my understanding of it increased so much when, when you can, when you can see it, you know, we're visual beings and we need to be able to visualize stuff. We can't see electricity. So um, yeah. a number is one thing, a graph is a whole nother. Um, and I, for 150 bucks, I tell all my students, go get a U scope. I mean, you're going to spend so much more than that on the snap on air hammer. Um, great tool, but 150 bucks, get yourself a U scope and even starting out, that's going to be such an awesome tool for you. Uh, yeah. so I try to push that as much as I can. I, I really wish that I would have bought one, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. No kidding. Well, I, I wish there would have been as much information out there when I was starting out the Facebook and the YouTube, and that wasn't even a thing. Um, that's, that's huge. Cause you can just, if you want to dedicate the time, um, you know, if, if you're not in school, you can go learn this stuff, you can pick up on it. And that is, that is phenomenal. A huge tool for anybody that's not using it, go out there and find uh, these videos and these uh, instructionals and all the, all the free webinars that are going on right now. Uh, take advantage of those too. It's, it's so amazing. I can't even keep up with all of them. <laughs> I, I see one and, and, and it happened yesterday. I'm like, 
I, you know, I, I'm busy working. I'm, I'm busy working during the day and then I go home and I'm busy with the family. And so it's, it's really hard to keep up on that. But I've probably had running in the background well over a hundred webinars since March. And it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So there's so much information. Yeah, it's, it's endless. Yeah, that's been my struggle too. Uh, I, I've been so busy uh, during this whole time. I don't know what it is about my area. The automotive repair is just out of control. But yeah, finding the time to to actually you sign up for these webinars and then try to make it and then have a life too. It's yeah. <laughs> it has been tough. Yeah. Um. Eve, I mean, so locally, we. Training locally, we, um, we get ATG twice a year. Um, CTI is in a town south of us, but it would be a seven hour commitment for me to go. Pretty much two hours to get there due to traffic after work, and then an hour to get back with, with a four hour class. And so I haven't even been to one. Um, I've done a couple weekend classes with world pack and those are great but um the big game changer was going to vision for the first time three years ago and that was it's you walk in and it's like you know these are the superstars i see on the facebook groups and youtube and um you know i'm here with them so that was really cool. And, and then you take the classes and it's just, you know, it's, it's three, three or four days of turning your brain to mush. And it's, it's, it's great. It's, it's the best experience ever. Right. Yeah. It's, it, it's, a, it's a ton of work to yes, get take in all that knowledge and uh, stay focused, everything, but you love every minute of it. Like you said, that uh, yeah. Vision. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, they have the educator classes and, um, I pay to go myself. And so I just, I just take the classes that I want to take. You know, last year I loaded up on pressure waveform classes and that is almost all I took the entire weekend. And, um, man, it's, it's just, it's just great. So hopefully we have it next year too, but it's, yeah, I, I'd encourage anybody to find a, um, a training event like that and go to it because you know half half of it half of it is um, the actual classes and then the other half is is the networking after classes and it's it's really just talking cars and diagnostics all the time and and I love it just nerding out yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's awesome well on the on the note of nerding out, uh, do you got any uh, interesting case studies or vehicles that you've seen lately? Um, one that was a problem lately was a 2007 Audi A4 with a large evap leak. Um, I pretty so this has um, I guess a Chrysler style. It pressurizes pressurizes the fuel tank and then watches over time to see if that pressure goes away. Um, so there's a pump that does it has, it has a vacuum operated pump. Yeah. That pressurizes the fuel tank. So there's a lot of things you can do. I mean, the diagnostic route is usually, you know, find the leak. So the evap purge valve is oftentimes a leak. Oh, backstory is when I got the car, this car had been to another shop a year ago and they replaced the leak detection pump, evap purge valve and the gas cap and nothing fixed it. All OEM parts. Um, so you got to find the leak. That's, you know, it's a large leak. So what I did, I, I pressurized the system and, you know, clamped off the, the, the um, evap valve, the purge valve, and still fails. I hook up the WPS and pressurize it, and it's not leaking. 
I take the charcoal canister out of the system, doesn't pass. And eventually I clamp off the, um, the pressure hose to the fuel tank at the leak detection pump and it does not pass. So essentially I blocked off everything after that and it still says large leak detected. Um, so I hooked up the scope to it and watched it. And you know what I don't have for this is a known good. So I'm watching it and, and I'm talking to Chris Martino about it and we, we both have nothing on this, what it should be doing, how it works. There's no SSP, which is um, dealer training information on this. There's basically no information on what the computer wants to see. So I got to set it aside. Boss takes it. He can't figure it out. And, um, you know, we, we figure, well, it's, you know, the, the ECM doesn't recognize that it's passing because it's obviously passing. There's no leak. And get a used ECM, put it in there at another shop. They look at it too. Nothing. No, no change. So I get it back. I still have a few days with it and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm not going to let this car beat me. I'm, I'm going to beat this car. And um, so one, the, the only thing that I hadn't done is load test all the wires. And so this ECM is buried underneath a, um, a chastity belt, if you will. It's, it has um, one time use bolts, shear bolts that hold the ECM in from being unplugged. And I had already got those out to get it ready to swap ECMs. And um, so all the wiring's available. So I load test this and I find wires are crossed. There's no, so this would be the pump activation wire, like that, that actually tells the um, vacuum solenoid to create pressure and the pump sense circuit which tells the computer it's holding vacuum or holding pressure. So those wires are crossed somewhere. I overlay, I do an external overlay with just, with just a long wire and I get it to pass. And so the computer never recognized that it had a, that it had a, a circuit fault. It only recognized that the pump sense circuit was was not doing what it was supposed to and was telling it that it had a large leak um so i fixed it yeah I, I do an overlay i fix it and then i find out the car's been in a rear end collision i don't see any damage to the wires but who knows what happened and it was only those two wires that were affected somewhere but when i pulled up all the um when i pulled up the um all the trim, I, I didn't see any physical damage to anything. So I, I don't know what happened, but yeah, that, that one was an interesting one. And yeah, no you know, kidding. It's, it's, it's know your enemy and, and know your known good. And, and now, you know what I have, I have a known good of that. So you'll never, you'll never see that one again. So <laughs> never, never. nobody will ever see this ever again. Yeah, and that's the way it works. Well, yeah, I, I was, I, I was really happy that I beat that car and, um, you know, that's always the challenge. Yeah. That's what keeps you coming back. You know, you get, uh, you get beat up a little bit, but man, when you finally make it through, you figure it out. Uh, that's, uh, that's a feeling that I don't think every person's job can, can give them uh, some people definitely, but it's, it's something unique to this industry i think yeah it's it's a job well done on something that you had no clue how how it worked some basics of it but yeah really there, there's so many different um systems in a car that, that nobody knows exactly everything about every vehicle so that's that's also what makes it fun i guess yeah, and the, the sometimes the lack of published information it leaves you guessing and in the dark and relying on known goods and stuff like that. That's the other yeah. side of it that's challenging. 
and with Volkswagen Audi, especially, you know, I, I, I get some um, code setting criteria, but not, not a lot. And um, I watch case studies on other vehicles and there's so much information available. I'm like, yeah, this, this looks so easy. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a fun challenge. Definitely. Well, hey, um, I wanted to see if you had any recommendations for anybody that's listening. And number one, if there's like a tool or a resource or a video or whatever. And then also, then this can be tied into the same thing. If you got any recommendations for a younger technician that's just getting started or somebody who is diving in and they really want to grow their skills, um, do, you, do you have anything you'd like to recommend? For, for the second part, um, also I want to start off with that first. I wish there was some way I could teach students how to get the fire in their belly about this trade. Um, that fire, you know, it, you'll call it intrinsic learning. Um, but that fire in their belly that wants them, wants to get them to learn more about it and to learn all they can and to actually seek out training. Um, you know, find out what part of the industry is really intriguing to you. You know, whether it's, whether it is being the best suspension guy out there or the best alignment tech out there, um, you know, hang the best brakes that you can, like that kind of stuff, you know, look, learn how to clean the hubs correctly and use the correct um, brake paste for everything, you know, try to do it a hundred percent each time. But for the diagnostic, for me, you know, it's, it was, it was a realization that I was in the dark ages and there was this training out there that I didn't even know about. And so once I started going to training, it was like, wow, I'm, you know, this is awesome. There's so much cool stuff to learn about this. It actually makes my job easier. Um, so I guess to the young students, you know, find out what makes you excited about this trade and go for it. You know, whether it's scan data or, you know, learning how to use OBD2 only, you know, OBD global on everything and being able to figure out all these issues just with OBD information, because a lot of that information is there. So it's, you know, like, or, or scope use, you know, learn, learn what electricity looks like. You know, I, I took a, a Gary Smith electrical class at vision last year and he got, he really only started to understand electricity when he started playing around with vintage radios with ra with um, vacuum tubes in them. You know, he, he, he found something like that and then all of a sudden he can apply it to automotive and, and it just, the light clicked. You know, it just, it just turned on and just made everything really easy and, and really a lot more interesting. So I like that part about it. Um, as far as a tool or a resource, um, you know, my, my two favorite things right now is ASE Wave and um, the Train by Text calendar. They have a Google calendar on there with all the webinars and I've been trying to follow that and, and look at as much stuff as I can. And they have a lot of videos too. And then you know, of, of course, there's tons of good YouTube information and learning how to sort the good from the bad is, is going to be part of the journey. Um, I mean, I've, I've been watching old Jim Morton and um, v Vanderbeek classes on ignition stuff. Those there's are the TST seminars on YouTube? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the TST seminars are there and, and are free. Um, so there's, 
there's so much stuff out there that honestly I had no idea about really until I found good automotive groups on Facebook and that, that social, um, that social group, you know, uh, allows so much for networking and learning new ideas that it's, it's just incredible. So. Yeah, there's a there's a bright side to social media, <laughs> thankfully, and yeah. uh, I'm in the same boat. I my world was expanded immensely uh, once I found out that there's other people out there that are into this, like I am, that have the passion for it. Uh, you know, if you if you're just at your shop and nobody else gives a rip you know, besides getting a paycheck, you kind of feel like you're on an island. Um, if you, if you are really into this stuff, but there are so many other really, really smart, friendly, helpful people out there uh, that are willing to share, willing to help. And yeah, those are, those are great resources. I will put, um, I'll put links to those in the show notes as well. Uh, a couple of those TST seminars that you mentioned and, uh, the other ones as well. Oh, it's AES Wave. I think I said yes. AES Wave. Yep, yep. I'll uh, I'll put a link to there I, yeah. as well. Tons of uh, awesome stuff. If you got some uh, got some money to spend, you can uh, get some good yeah. tools there. <laughs> well, it it shows what's available too. You know, it's 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 not a tool truck that only has hand tools and and scanners. They actually have a lot of really good. Um, specialty equipment you know the um the u test kit for example the the breakout kit is one of my top 10 favorite tools for sure i get comments on that because i bring it with me to most jobs or you know it's it's usually with me when i'm going to the car and i open it up and i, I so many people ask me like where did you get that 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 just looks awesome uh, for, yeah. for testing terminals and stuff like that. So yeah, anything else? I think that's about it. Hey, um, thank you so much for coming on. This was, uh, this was great. Good. Yeah, it's fun. Maybe, um, maybe we should do one next year sometime. See what happens in the fall with school. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, hands-on education is, is going to take this. I watched um, uh, Jim Corkins and Rich Falco do the uh, electronic, little electric um, class they had last week, last week through CTI. Um, that'll be a replay as well. But they used that Electrude um, engine simulator on there. And man, that's, it, it's awesome. Yeah, we have Electude for our students. Um, they buy a subscription and um, tons and tons of different modules they can do on the online stuff. And it's a really nice um, addition to what we do in class and in the shop um, but to just support what, what we talk about and to give them a little bit of visual extra practice with it. But yeah, that, that online learning for a trade is very, very challenging. Uh, for like our auto body and our welding instructor, um, at least I have scan tools and scope patterns and electrical I can do online and yeah. we, can, we can work with that. But I mean, for a welding instructor, what do you that's do? Cool. Yeah, that's really hard. Because that's all muscle memory. That's, you got to have it in your hand. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully they figure something out. I know they're, they are, administration is working really hard and we've got a meeting this week actually to kind of update us on where everything is at and the plans for the fall, but man, everything changes so fast um, yeah. with, with the whole situation. We don't really know. So just hope for the best. Yep. Well, cool. Thanks, Sean. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. One more big thank you to Hans for coming on the show with me today. I really appreciate it. I also appreciate everyone who is listening to the podcast. I hope you're enjoying it, getting something out of it, and are able to benefit from some of the things that we can bring to you here. So with that being said, uh, have a great day and let's get out there and start fixing the world one car at a time.